Italians fought in many battles and many campaigns during the course of their involvement in World War II, and they lost most of them. Correction, they got thoroughly trounced in most of them. Italian military incompetence has become a byword, a stereotype, a veritable meme. Everyone now knows the Italians were lousy soldiers. Now, while the Italians really did not perform very well in World War II, it is unfair to put this all down to incompetence or cowardice, although unfortunately you can find evidence for those propositions. It is certainly true that the training of Italian troops could be very patchy. Most of the responsibility for training was placed on company commanders, and their quality varied enormously, with some important aspects being completely neglected. American soldiers at the Battle of Geller in 1943 found that their Italian opponents were tough enough but had absolutely no idea about night fighting. There were problems with the quantity of training too. The British and Americans reckoned it would take about 25 weeks of training to make a decent rookie tank crew. Italian tankers had 25 days of training and then they were on the front lines. At 25 days they barely know how to operate the thing. It is also true that the average Italian soldier was not as highly motivated as his opposite numbers in the militaries of the other major contenders in World War II, but then, with only 25 days training, you could hardly be very confident. Besides, by the time Italy entered World War II, the nation had pretty much been at war for nearly 10 years already, fighting in Ethiopia, Albania and in the Spanish Civil War. This had drained the treasury, consumed huge amounts of military resources and sapped a lot of the country's enthusiasm for fighting. Italians were getting tired of sending their sons and husbands off to faraway lands. In any event, if you were an Italian, would you want to fight and possibly die for the likes of Benito Mussolini? The myth of the Italians being useless at fighting is now so prevalent that it is very difficult to appreciate just how differently things were viewed at the time. In the 1930s, Italy was a country that was feared. It was a very young nation, it had only been united in 1861. It was a very aggressive nation, it made no secret of its imperial pretensions, all this talk of a second Roman Empire and referring to the Mediterranean as Mara Nostrum, in you know, our sea. It was stable, it had come through the depression much better and had recovered much quicker than the great western democracies, an event that seemed to validate the fascist system which had been in power since 1922. So yes, people were scared of Italy, or at least of what Italy might do. If it followed through on its imperial ambitions, that would inevitably lead to conflict with the existing major Mediterranean powers, at that time Britain and France. Neither of them were keen for a repeat performance of the carnage of World War I. And it's not as if there weren't good reasons to be scared. Italy had a very large army, some 70 odd divisions in the late 1930s, and they had never been defeated. It had a very modern navy, the largest in the Mediterranean, beautiful ships with fine lines, very fast. There was a particularly large submarine arm. Italy was also major air power, a status confirmed by the interwar Schneider seaplane races with Britain and the US. In fact, it is fair to say that a lot of the modern disparagement of the Italian armed forces has its foundation in a reaction against the heightened perception of their pre-war threat. People have been apprehensive of conflict with Italy for a long time, and when that conflict finally came, and Italy turned out to be the ultimate paper tiger, quite naturally that apprehension quickly turned to contempt. Something along the lines of, is this what we were getting so worked up about? So, why did the Italians put up such a poor showing? There are a lot of reasons for this, and many of them feed upon and reinforce each other so it can be difficult to figure out the relative importance of each and which is cause and which is effect. One obvious example of what I mean is that defeat corrodes morale, which in turn makes defeat more likely, leading to a further loss in morale. Defeat can quickly become a pattern that reinforces itself. After a while, the Italian soldiers were almost expecting to be beaten, and if you had that mindset, you are already halfway towards actually being beaten. Something else that needs to be considered is the effect of propaganda. One of the most significant dents in the aura of Italian military prowess came in December of 1940, during the first Great British Desert Offensive, something called Operation Compass. A British force of about 35,000 completely destroyed the Italian 10th Army, which was over four times its size, 
taking most of them prisoner. Pretty shattering, but it has to be realised that at the time the war was going very badly for Britain. Although the threat of German invasion had been thwarted by the Battle of Britain, and the Royal Navy had swept Axis merchant shipping from the seas, in every other regard affairs were not going well. The U-boats would begin to have a significant effect on merchant shipping. The army had been successively driven out of Norway, the Low Countries, France and British Somaliland. It was a depressing record of defeat, retreat and hurried evacuation. Britain, and particularly the British Army, desperately needed a flashy victory, and when they got it, boy did they make sure everyone knew about it. The dawn of another day in Libya, when from daybreak to dusk the Imperial Army of the Nile continues its brilliant advances across the western desert. Through the choking desert dust, mechanised units forge ahead in pursuit of the fleeing Italians. Across the face of the desert, abandoned Italian tanks are strewn in confusion. In their hasty retreat, the black shirt commanders thought as little about their equipment as they did of their men. A vast conglomeration of war weapons lies scattered and deserted. Columns of captured Italians stream back, their numbers reaching to the horizon. There can be few of these men who now feel anything but contempt for a crumbling ideology which has brought them nothing but misery. The fate of aggression is sealed. Mussolini's crazy adventure to which he has erected many monuments is doomed, as surely as day is followed by night. Now there is no doubt that Operation Compass was a major success for the British, and a major catastrophe for the Italians, but the odds were by no means as overwhelming as mere numbers would indicate. Although not designed as such, to all intents and purposes, Italian armies in 1940 were nothing more than giant colonial police forces, and that was fine for chasing Libyans round the desert or Albanians up and down mountains, but they're always going to be in trouble when they come up against a disciplined professional army of an industrial power, like Britain, or America, or Russia, or even France or Greece. Much of the Italian strength in compass was in largely immobile, unmotorised infantry, which was of little importance in the desert, except in positional warfare, which didn't happen too often. Far more important were aircraft, artillery and especially tanks, and in these regards the two sides were a good deal more even. The Italians had only a few more armoured vehicles than the British did, and most of them were three-ton machine gun armed L3 tankettes, which were no match for their British A9 cruisers and Matilda tanks. The latter in particular was virtually impervious to Italian anti-tank guns. Another significant factor that contributed heavily to the poor public perception of the Italian army was the behaviour of their German allies. Because of these disastrous initial desert campaigns, it was all too easy for German commanders to use the Italians as fall guys for their own shortcomings. If an operation went well, a German commander would grab all the credit. If things went wrong, he could just blame the Italians, and because everyone knew the Italians were useless, it was an excuse that worked and the more that German commanders did that, the more it reinforced the image of Italian military incompetence. The real root cause of Italy's troubles boils down to one simple fact. The country's grand ambitions exceeded its capabilities, and by a considerable margin as well. Mussolini craved prestige and power for Italy, and he thought the way to both lay in military prowess. The armed forces were allocated large proportions of the national budget, way beyond what the nation could effectively support and huge numbers of young men were called up to give the impression of a powerful military force. But compared to the great powers of the time, Italy was a small nation with a very modest population. It was overwhelmingly rural, with a very small industrial base mostly concentrated in the north of the country. Moreover, what industrial capacity did exist was disorganised and saddled with old plant. Essentially, Italy was a second-rate nation trying to be a great power. Some statistics illustrate the point. Italy was in the war as a member of the Axis for about three years. Their tank production over that period amounted to about 2,000 units. That is pitiful. The Russians were making that many every month in 1942. Military aircraft production was only marginally better, not many more than about 5,000. 
or about 2% of what the Americans made over the same period. The results of these factors were very large forces that were acutely short of supplies, transport and equipment, particularly heavy equipment. A lot of the stuff that was available wasn't particularly good. Much of it was quite old and almost all of it was very light. The Italian military was fixated on fighting a war to the north against their traditional enemies, France and Austria. That was, after all, where most of their military effort had gone in World War I. Fighting in the Alps meant the Italians had large numbers of mountain troops and a strong emphasis on mobility. Italian tanks were small and light, partly because it meant they could be faster and cheaper, but mostly because the small bridges in the area could not support the weight of heavy vehicles. As a result, there were no Italian heavy tanks, no equivalent of the Tiger or the Churchill. There weren't really any Italian medium tanks. There were no Italian heavy bombers either, no equivalent to the US Flying Fortress or the British Lancaster. There were no Italian heavy fighters, no equivalent to the Lockheed Lightning or the de Havilland Mosquito. Even very basic equipment was in short supply. Heavy anti-tank guns, heavy anti-aircraft guns, heavy machine guns, even submachine guns. All had to be doled out in small quantities to large infantry formations. At the start of the war, this did not matter too much. The world's armed forces had been built up in the calm days of peacetime, and everyone was pretty much in the same state. Italy was able to keep up, even if they were having to pedal hard to do it. Once war was declared, the combatant nations geared their economies up for wartime production. The only problem was that Italy's military industries were already working at near capacity and struggling to keep their bloated pre-war military going. The shortage of industrial output affected more than mere numbers. Italian factories were hard put to repair and replace the equipment that was being damaged or lost in the field, never mind develop improved weapons. As the war progressed, this led to an increasing imbalance on the battlefield, not only in quantity, but also in quality. An example. The principal Italian tank of World War II was something called the M1340. M stood for medio, that is medium, at least according to the Italian tank weight standard, 13 for its weight in tonnes, and 40 for its year of introduction, 1940. Apart from the fact that no one else would regard a 13 ton tank as medium, the American Stuart light tank is heavier than that, for the early war period the M1340 was quite good. It wasn't perfect, it was seriously underpowered, mechanically unreliable in desert conditions, and made of very poor quality armour plate that had a tendency to shatter rather than resist hits by anti-tank shells. But it was simple to make, the armour plate was reasonably sloped, it had a very good main armament. The 47mm 32 gun was certainly at least as good as anything that British or German tanks had at the time. The problem was that the Italians were still using this thing two years later, when the Allied tanks they had initially faced had long since been replaced. There had been a very minor upgrade, called the M1441, but it amounted to little more than a slightly larger hull to accommodate a slightly bigger engine. The embodiment of the resulting imbalance took place at the Battle of El Alamein. The principal Italian armoured force, the famous Arietti, or Ram Division, had been stationed out of position at the start of the battle, and by the time it had been redeployed, the British had already broken through the Axis defences. To conduct an orderly retreat, Rommel had to hold the British off for as long as possible. Arietti was by now the only large-scale Axis formation that had not yet been committed into the battle, and so he ordered it to support the rearguard. But in moving up to do so, it ran full tilt into the British 4th Armour Brigade, equipped with M3 Grant tanks and the then new Sherman. A Sherman is twice the size of an M1340. It's considerably faster across desert terrain. It has better quality armour plate that is twice as thick, a main gun that is twice as large and that fires shells almost three times as large, twice as far. Oh, and there were twice as many of them as well. Do the arithmetic. It wasn't a battle, it was a slaughter. In a four-hour fight, Ariette was crushed, almost every tank knocked out and every gun disabled. The few shreds that managed to escape were overrun on the coast road. They stopped nothing. Italian tankers could see their armour-piercing shots ricocheting from the hulls of their opponents. It was only by firing at the tracks that they could immobilise a few of them. In the meantime, the armour-piercing shells from the Grants and Shermans were ripping through the Italian tanks with ease. It was not for nothing that M1340s were nicknamed Mobile Coffins. Incidentally, the rearguard Arietti was supporting was the Italian Folgori Paratroop Division, 
which had held off attacks by four British divisions, including an armoured one, for the better part of two weeks, inflicting heavy casualties. The British allowed them to keep their guns when they were finally overrun, in large part because they had no ammunition to shoot from them. They quite literally fought to the last bullet. What of the other services? The Air Force, the Regia Aeronautica, was very large and had some promising airframes, but they suffered from the inability of Italian industry to produce inline engines, so they had to make do with less powerful radials. Also, aircraft are complex systems with many parts that wear out quickly, and replacing them was also a struggle for the armaments manufacturers. As a result, serviceability of Italian aircraft was appallingly low, often less than 50%. The Navy, the Regia Marina, was the best prepared of the services for war, but even so many of its best ships were still under construction when war was declared. It suffered from a severe shortage of oil, Italy not being a nation blessed with its own supply, and this severely limited the Navy's mobility. Their submarines were too large and took far too long to dive, which led to many unnecessary losses. The lack of an organic naval air service was a major weakness that was exacerbated by a shortage of anti-aircraft guns. To sum up, the main reasons the Italians did so badly in World War II was that they had a largely immobile infantry army, patchily trained and very short of supplies, transport and equipment, particularly heavy equipment. They had a large air force of obsolete planes, a high proportion of which spent most of the war grounded through lack of spares, and a modern but ill-balanced navy that could make few attacks because it was so acutely short of fuel. Faced with all that, they didn't do too badly. Thank you.